Hey everybody, I'm Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm reading the Bible through in one year. Today is day 292 of our one-year Bible reading plan. I'm glad that you're with me today for this journey, getting some Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. We're on our second lap through in the book of Proverbs. It's been such a fantastic journey. If you haven't been here for all 292 days, maybe you've skipped around or this is the first time you're finding this channel where I'm reading the Bible through in a year. Go back to day one. Start at any point in time. Don't wait for January. Don't wait for Monday. You can do it. Just start now. 365 days of God's word. You will never be the same again. And yeah, it is hard. And yeah, it takes a long time to do. And people fall short and then we judge ourselves. Don't do that. Let me read it to you. I'm happy to be part of your faith journey as you are part of mine. When you hit the thumbs up button underneath each video, it logs it into your YouTube library so that you don't lose any of the days. You can keep track of which ones that you've watched. That's a really important movement. It also lets you and I co-labor together in Christ. You are playing a role in the expansion of the way of the worshiper and getting more of the gospel online by interacting with this channel. Make sure that you're a subscriber to this channel. That's another great way that you can do that. And if you've just been skipping around, go to your YouTube library, check out what you've read, and just keep going going 365 days of delving into God's word. I've already felt transformation in my own heart. I know that you will too, because God's word is living, active, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Like the Bible says, why do we need that? To divide between the joint and the marrow. Those are the natural things we walk through in this world, the soul and the spirit, that the essence of our humanity and our eternal inner man. That's what the word does. According to Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, it discerns the thoughts and intents of our hearts. We need that every single day as we're going to navigate this space because it's pretty dark. We need more of God's light. Check out the resources I've linked below. There's a reflection sheet that is specific to today's reading where you can just get application of God's word in your life and understanding as well through articles I link and other resources to the way of the worshiper.com where I do deeper dives, journalism style, where I pull pieces together and tell different stories that we see of the human experience in relationship to God. God's expanded story, which is the testimony of Jesus Christ. You can find those linked below. Knowledge, great. Lots of people have knowledge about the Bible. They just don't know how to use it. And then understanding and application. It's a completion of how we look at God's word as we walk the way of the worshiper. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. We commit this time to you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, come and have your way in your word, in our lives. Lord, we receive and yield to you, your revelation, your correction and chastisement, your blessing and mercy, greater knowledge of who you are and what you do. Father, come and have your way in our hearts through your word. We mix it with our faith. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Okay, here we are continuing in Jeremiah. Speaking of chastisement, God's people have reached a breaking point with the Lord and yet we see his mercy. In fact, before we begin, I'm going to read something to you from yesterday's reading. When we were reading, a couple things stood out to me. And I came back in my own time of reflection. And we were looking in Jeremiah 20, uh, Jeremiah 30, where we were seeing the, the Lord was talking about the exiles of Israel. Okay, so I'm just going to read to you what we read yesterday from Jeremiah 30, 12 through 14. And then I'm going to fill in some blanks for you. I have to stop and do this before we go into the next thing, because every time we see Jesus in the Old Testament, he's concealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the new covenant. So powerful. I like to stop and get my highlighter out and say, hey, we found Jesus because he's everywhere. The entire, the entire book of this Bible is a testimony of Jesus Christ through a foreshadowing or a fulfillment. How wonderful. So this is what we read yesterday. Or thus says the Lord. He was talking about the chastisement. He said, I'm going to chastise you. I'm going to make a full, I will not make a full end of you, but I will correct you for all the abominations, all the things that have led us to this point. Now it's time. And even then he had mercy. He said, you can flee willingly. You can go with the Babylonians or you can stay in Jerusalem, but I'm going to destroy Jerusalem. Very similar themes to we see in Sodom and Gomorrah. Very, in fact, he has compared them to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how bad it was. So, the Lord said, your, bu your bruise is incurable. Your wound is severe. There's no one who's going to plead your, your cause that you may be bound up. There's no one to heal with healing medicine. Your lovers have forgotten you. They don't seek you. I've wounded you with the wound of an enemy, the chastisement of a cruel one because of the multitude of your iniquities and because your sins are numerous. Okay, ready? Where's Jesus? 
The Lord said, your bruise is incurable. Isaiah said, the Messiah was bruised for our transgressions. The Lord said, your wound is severe. Isaiah said, he was wounded for our iniquities. The Lord said, there was no one to plead your cause, that you have no healing medicine. Well, guess what? By his stripes, Isaiah said, we are healed. The Lord said, I've wounded you with the wound of an enemy and the chastisement of a cruel one. The chastisement of our peace, Isaiah said, was laid upon him. And he, the Lord said, why do you cry because of your affliction? Do you remember when the Lord said in Isaiah, through Isaiah, when the Lord sees the anguish of his soul, he will be satisfied. I found Jesus. That was in yesterday's reading, and I was so struck by it. I didn't want to stop. I wanted to keep going, but today I'm stopping. And I want to tell you that God's mercy is there. He's speaking prophetically. He's saying these terrible things that are going to come upon God's people. But ultimately, we couldn't save ourselves because we were so lost and dead in our trespasses and sins. There was no one to plead our cause. He sent us a mediator between God and man. That's what the angels cried out, peace on earth, God's good will toward men. The mediator of the covenant of everlasting peace was Jesus Christ, bruised and wounded and chastised because of us. He sent his own son because there was nothing we could do for ourselves. You see, I get a little misty-eyed, but I don't shut up or change the subject, as my dad would say, because I know what the Lord has done for me. So there you go. I found Jesus. So today we're going to read Jeremiah 31, 27 through the end of 32. Surely the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of a beast. It shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck them up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days, they will say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone will die for his own iniquity. Every man that eats the sour grape, his teeth will be set on edge. Surely the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I found Jesus, the mediator of the better covenant. It will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. Found the Holy Spirit. I will put my law within them. Yes and amen. I will write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord or they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night who stirs up the seas so the waves roar and the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. Surely the days are coming, says the Lord, when the city will be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The measuring line shall stretch out straight to the hill of Gareb and then shall turn to Goa, the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields to the Kidron gate, to the corner of the horse gate toward the east, will be holy to the Lord. It will not be plucked up nor thrown down any more forever. Now we're in Jeremiah 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, for then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the house of the king of Judah. For Zedekiah king of Judah had shut him up, saying, Why do you prophesy? 
You say, thus says the Lord, I'm about to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but will surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and will speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And he will lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he will be until I visit him, says the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you will not succeed. So Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you, saying, Buy my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. So Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. I bought the field of Hanamel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed and summoned witnesses and weighed the money from him in the balances. So I took the deed of purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, in the sight of Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase before all the Jews who sat in the courts of the prison. I charged Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, this sealed deed of purchase, and this deed which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be processed again in this land. Now, when I had delivered the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, truly you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm, and there is nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands and recompense the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them, O great and mighty God. The Lord of hosts is his name, great in counsel and mighty indeed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. You have set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even to this day, and in Israel and among other men. You have made yourself a name as it is today, and you have brought your people Israel out of the hand of Egypt with signs and wonders and with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. And you have given them this land, which you swore to their fathers to give to them a land flowing with milk and honey. They entered it and possessed it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They have done nothing of all you have commanded them to do. Therefore, you have caused all this calamity to come upon them. See, the siege ramps have come to the city to take it, and the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who fight against it because of the sword and of the famine and of the pestilence and what you have spoken has come to pass as you can see. O Lord God, you have said to me, buy the field for money and call in witnesses, although the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will give this city into the hands of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans who fight against this city will come and set the city on fire and burn it with houses, burn it with all the houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense to Baal and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Indeed, the sons of Israel and the sons of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the sons of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, says the Lord. Indeed, this city has been to me a provocation of my anger and my fury from the day they built it, even to this day, so that I should remove it from before my face. Because of all the evil of all the sons of Israel and all the sons of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they... Their kings, their officials, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they have turned their back to me and not their face, though I taught them rising up early and teaching them that they have not listened nor received instruction, but they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. They built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of Ben-Hanam, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I had not commanded them nor did it come into my mind. 
that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you shall say, it shall be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. See, I will gather them out of all the countries wherever I have driven them in my anger and in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again to this place and I will cause them to dwell safely and they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their good and for their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant uh, for them with I that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so they will not depart from me. Indeed, I will rejoice over them to do good. And I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. I'm going to grab this here. I see Jesus. I will give them one heart and one way. Jesus said that he was the way, the truth and the life and that no one would come to the father except through him. Love seeing that there. I will rejoice over them. I will plant them with my whole heart. I love that the Lord says this and with my whole soul an everlasting covenant found Jesus again. All right. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great calamity upon people, so I will bring upon them all the good I have promised them. Fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is desolate without man or beast. It is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for monies, sign and seal deal, deeds and call in witnesses in the land of Benjamin and in the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and in the cities of the mountains and in the cities of the valley and in the cities of the Negev, for I will restore their fortunes, says the Lord. Okay, we're going to stop there in our Old Testament reading. We found Jesus uh, throughout. What a beautiful testimony it is of God's mercy. Yes, he said in our reading that we saw yesterday, I will not make a full end of you, but I will correct you in measure and I will not leave you altogether unpunished. But that's okay because whom the Lord loves, he chastens not to break you. That's what Satan wants to do. God wants to remake you. Satan wants to leave you broken. God wants to bind up your wounds. It's by his stripes that you were healed. Okay. Let's go over and read in the New Testament. Reading today, 1 Timothy chapter 3 of Paul's wonderful pastoral epistles to young Timothy, the pastor in Ephesus. Yesterday when we read, Paul was giving Timothy some shepherding advice. A pastor is a shepherd. You can be a woman and be a pastor, quote unquote, a shepherd over other women, over children. We all have roles of pastoral roles, not maybe not a governmental role like in the structure, the hierarchy structure of God's, the way that God has ordained the church to run. But certainly believers should shepherd other believers who are younger in the faith or just younger in general, like children. So he's giving, he's giving Timothy some pastoral advice, but it really applies to anyone who is a shepherd of people in the unique roles between men and women that God has given to every believer to make supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving for everyone. Well, there it is. So when you have a pastoral burden to shepherd other people, that's what he told Timothy yesterday in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's take a look now at 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is the faithful saying, if a man desires the office of an overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, sober, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not greedy for money, but patient, not argumentative nor covetous, and the one who manages his own, his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to manage his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? He must not be newly converted so that he does not become prideful and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good reputation among those who are outsiders so that he does not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be serious, not insincere, not given to much wine, not greedy, keeping the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let them first be tested, then being found blameless. Let them serve as deacon, deacons. Likewise, their wives must be serious, not slanderers, sober and faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, 
managing their children in their own households well for those who have served well in the office of a deacon, purchase for themselves good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed, you might know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of foundation and truth. Without question, great is the mystery of godliness. God was revealed in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. That's where we're going to stop today in 1 Timothy. Great chapter to reflect on today about the governmental roles in the church that God has given to men and the way that women interact as well. I'm going to link again. I did yesterday. I'm going to link below again to the teachings that Mike Winger, the Bible thinker, has put out regarding the roles of women in ministry. There is a scriptural, as hard as it is as we we wouldn't like to think that we are today, there is a scriptural God-ordained role for women and for men in the governance of the church, not in shepherding other believers in the way that that looks. We have unique roles and they're distinct and they're separate, but they work together. They're complementary to each other. So take a look at that below. He goes really deep. And if you'd like increased understanding what the Bible says in that area, I have it below. All right, let's finish up with a Psalm and a proverb. Reading today, Psalm chapter 88. For the music director, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah to the melody of suffering in affliction, a contemplative mascal of Haman, the Ezraite. These contemplative mascals are great. They show the real and raw emotion of a human being who has faith in the Lord and walks through hard times. One of the most beautiful things I see in the Psalms and throughout all the people of God when they're praising and praying to the Lord. In their prayers, not in the praises, in the praises is where we minister to the Lord, the ministry of the sacrifice of thanksgiving, period. In our prayers, you can say a prayer to song, in our prayers, we cry out, we pour out, we acknowledge to God, we confess with our mouth, the things that are already in our heart, our soul, our mind, our spirit. God already knows, first of all, he doesn't need to know, but when we present it to him willingly, we give it to him. We ask him the hard questions. Yes, sometimes we shake our fists. Sometimes we make demands like Job did. And God had an answer for Job. You can go check that out in the last couple chapters of Job. A very beautiful, powerful answer. But if we don't present God all of ourselves and we don't empty ourselves completely, how can we expect a complete filling? We must empty and we can be filled. Okay, so this is these contemplative mascals are pretty deep. Here we go. Oh, Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I'm counted with those who go down to the grave. I'm a man who has no strength, like one who is set free from among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, like those who remember you no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the depths of the pit and dark and deep regions. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves." Say la, think about it. You have caused my companions to be far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I'm shut up. I cannot escape. My eye is dim from my affliction. Lord, I call daily on you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Will you show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead rise up to praise you? Say la, think about it. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness? In Abaddon, should your wonders be known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But unto you have I cried, O Lord. And in the morning, my prayer goes before you. O Lord, why do you cast away my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I'm afflicted and close to death since my youth while I suffer your terrors and I'm helpless. Your fierce wrath sweeps over me. Your terrors destroy me. They come around me daily like a flood. They encircle me together. You have caused me to be afar off from my lovers and friends. And my companion is darkness. That's it. That is Psalm 88. That's a difficult Psalm to read. Have you ever felt this way? Can you relate to this? These accusations he's making against God. That's okay. God already knew it was in his heart. So he wrote it down. He poured out. And he says here, this is, this is the answer. God has an answer for him and he knows that. So he said, I call daily upon you. 
I stretch out my hands to you. He is in, this man is in prayer and he is in praise to the Lord because whom has he in heaven but the Lord? There's none on earth. God is the strength of his heart and his portion forever. That's what we see in the book of Psalms. Okay, there it is. If you're having a Psalm 88 day, there's your way. Psalm 88 verse nine. All right, let's go finish up with the proverb. Reading today, Proverbs 25 verses 20 through 22. As he who takes away a garment in cold weather and as vinegar on soda, so is he who sings songs to a heavy heart. If your enemy's hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will reap coals of fire upon his head and the Lord will reward you. That's it. Day 292 is done. Hit the thumbs up button underneath this video. Check out the resources link below for continued understanding, knowledge, and application, all the things that make believers strong and effective in our faith as we navigate the darkness of this world. What a great reading this has been today. It's definitely one for reflection. I'm Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Those resources below are going to be very interesting, especially regarding the women in ministry. It's a substantial teaching, but a worthy one. All right. I'm Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you for the reading of your word. We worship you, Lord. We praise you. You are worthy. Father, as we pour out today, we desire that you would fill us, Lord. Show us what we can't see, where we need to go, what we need to do. Father, we yield to you and everything we have is yours because you are a God of mercy, worthy of praise. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.